I want to welcome you to the Fenton United Methodist Church. Um, it was very difficult this morning not to go and sit in front of the piano and pretend like I was playing that, but I, I didn't want it to make too silly. So um, We are thankful that uh, we have uh, musical talent such as Emily, who uh, can record stuff for us, so when she is out of town uh, and, and not here, um, it, it works well because we can use the recordings. One of the things we're doing this morning is this is Improv Sunday. So this makes it a little trickier with Emily not here. Um, and the way we're going to manage it is we're going to limit the selections to the hymnal. And the reason for that is we have a recording of every hymn, hymn in the hymnal that we can tap into and use. So um, if you haven't done so already, grab a hymnal and start looking between 195, I think, let's see, it's here, better say it right, between 195 and 255, um, those hymns and prayers there are what we're going to uh, ask for selections from you. And so you can be looking through that. We're going to need five hymns and one prayer. So there's lots of opportunities, especially with the, the limited group that's here this morning. So I was thinking we almost qualify as a small group. So I knew this was going to be a rough Sunday because of Thanksgiving and people exposed to folks. Um, etc. and worried about being exposed to people who are exposed to folks. So that's using good judgment. And we're doing a few things differently through the Christmas season. One is we're asking you to go ahead and continue just wearing your mask all the time. We know that's a hassle, but it's an easy thing to do. Yeah. And uh, if you have to tug it down below your nose because it's steaming up your glasses, we understand. Uh, when you're not, you know, when you're social distancing, you can be a little, a little easier on the mask, okay? So we're just using some more extreme measures in this extreme time because so many people have uh, the COVID. And uh, we apologize in a way, and yet we want to be safe. So we, we're not sorry completely. And uh, we're, we're just sorry about the fact that we have to do it for the disease, but we're not sorry that we have something that we can do to make things safer, and that's our goal. So our goal is not to transfer uh, the disease here at a church event. That includes worship. And if you follow these basic rules, it becomes unlikely, not impossible. And so um, if, if you decide, oh, I just feel too nervous to come, that's understandable. We have a lot of people in that boat, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, you got to be comfortable with what you're doing to keep yourself safe. Um, so after the hymn selections, we're going to get a selection again for Scripture that, we're, that the sermon will be on. And that is also limited today because it is the first Sunday of Advent. I've picked out four long passages that you can select from. Now, we're not going to read, you know, two chapters for our scripture. Uh, but you can select something from Matthew's chapter 1 and 2, Luke chapters 1 and 2, John chapter 1 verses 1 through 18, or Revelation 12. These are the four places in the New Testament, the Bible even, that um, refers to Christ's birth, uh, the coming of Jesus in the flesh. So these are the passages that basically you can select from and give your suggestion. So we're going to start off with the hymns. Who's got a selection for hymns? Uh, we got two in the back. We'll start at the, the crazy person waving her arms. Okay, yeah, what you got? 219. Okay. What's yours? 217. Okay. Away in a manger is 217. Away in a manger? 
Wow, I remembered that. That's amazing. I never have trouble with numbers. It's names that always give me trouble. It's weird the way my brain's wired. Okay, who, who's got another suggestion? Yes. 196. Yeah, the, just while we're waiting for somebody else to give a suggestion, the, the first hymns are what's called Advent hymns, or hymns about the promised coming of Jesus. The second group of hymns are Christmas hymns about the first coming of Jesus. So the others can refer to both. The, the Advent hymns can be both the first or the second, and, uh, or either one. Just to mention that. Who else has a suggestion? We need two more. This is your opportunity. Yes, sir. 211, not all seven verses. Is that Oh Come All You Faithful? What is 211? Come, O Come, Emmanuel. All right. Yeah, that's right. Okay, like I said, the names escape me. All right, one more. Yes, ma'am. Oh, wait, we got a way in a major two seventeen already. So you you have your your hope has been fulfilled. Anybody else? The first Noel. What number is that? 245, the first Noel. And then I need a prayer. If you look down where it says unison prayer in your bulletin, it actually gives each of the six possibilities. So take a moment, look that over. I'm sorry, what? Those, uh, no, they're mostly prayers, but I think there's one that might be a poem or a song that would work as a prayer. I don't remember. But they're mostly prayers. 225, that's, I think, Christmas, right? Oh, whoa, very improvisational. Here's a number. Do with what you can. Okay. Yeah, I can't wait to find out what it is. That, that's going to be interesting. Okay, we got our prayer. Now we need a scripture passage. Who's got a recommendation on a scripture passage? This limited choices makes it easy. Revelation. Do you have a specific bit or you want to do the whole chapter? Okay, we may, we may do the whole chapter. We'll just see. But I want you to look at it. i tell you what, I'll read the whole chapter. And I may even preach from the whole chapter. It's just there's a lot there. But we'll take it. Because we can. All right. Revelation 12. Now here's how we're going to proceed forward. For a while, we were kind of nervous because the computer was having issues, and I was saying, well, you know, it is Improv Sunday. If This would be the best day to have the computer give us fits and not work. So, But um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read chapter 12 of Revelation from the New Revised Standard Version. And uh, I'd say that's the one you have in your pew, but you don't. Sorry. Uh, we've moved everything out but the hymnals. You're going to need the hymnals to sing from. But next, starting next week, you won't have hymnals, songbooks, Bibles. We're just, again, we're taking out one more layer of things that could possibly, in some weird stretch of the imagination, be contaminated. So that's unlikely to happen, but we're just going to get into that practice for Christmas. Because during Christmas Eve, we won't be able to use those things as well because we have multiple services on one day. There, one won't follow after the other, though. There's time in between on Christmas Eve so we can clean the sanctuary, sanitize it, and uh, we're ready to go for the next one. So just a few things that are happening. One other thing I want to mention in this announcement time 
is that uh, next Sunday is Communion Sunday. And instead of going around and serving communion to folks, we're going to have the elements in the pew with the bulletin. And you'll have to come and see it. <laughs> but uh, we've designed it and we'll give you instructions then. We're not going to waste time this morning doing that. But we've designed it so that we hope we can avoid any kind of spills and trash and get that all disposed of. And on Christmas Eve, we'll do it the same way. Just a heads up on that. But uh, so we'll have communion, but nobody will be serving you communion in person. You will serve yourself and we'll have the ability to do that. I think it's going to work. So um, just mention that to you. And so now, what are we going to start with? Do we got the first Noel, which is number uh, 245. I'm just going to lead, well, actually, I'm going to help lead the music. Um, you're welcome to stand if you're able. Tina, were you going to sing for us uh, where we could hear you to have somebody to follow? Or? I'll try. I'm not a soprano. So. Okay. Well, I'm not anything. So there you go. I'm just whatever. It, the right note, it seems like I should be singing. I sing that one. So how many verses we're going to sing of this? There are five. I suggest we sing three of them. 245. That sounds good to me. Yeah, you could just, you know, fade it out and then you can shut it off. Go to the next. sound a little fast.
You may be seated. We're going to have the lighting of the Advent wreath. Well, one candle on the Advent wreath. This is the first Sunday of Advent as I read the scriptures. This is Revelation chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. A great portent appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pangs, in the agony of giving birth. Then another portent appeared in heaven, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. Then the dragon stood before the woman who was about to bear a child, so that he might devour her child as soon as it was born. And he gave birth to a son. Excuse me. <clears throat> and she gave birth to a son. <clears throat> a male child who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was snatched away and was taken to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God. So there she can be nourished for 1,260 days. And a war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back. But they were defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. The great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven proclaiming, Now have come the salvation and the power of the kingdom of our God, and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our comrades has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. But they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they did not cling to life even in the face of death. Rejoice then, you heavens, and those who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you with great wrath because he knows that his time is short. So when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to a male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she could fly from the serpent into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time. Then from his mouth the serpent poured water like a river after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman. It opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured out from his mouth. Then the dragon was angry with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her children, those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus." Then the dragon took a stand on the sand of the seashore. All right. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. So our call to prayer is going to be what? 196. No, what it, it's not right. The thing with improv is it's, so it's what number? 211. 211. We're just going to do the first verse. Gotcha. We're good. That's easy. Just remain seated as we prepare our hearts for a time of prayer. Let this first verse of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel be kind of uh, our call to prayer. That is uh, a way for us to center our, our thoughts and our heart as we prepare for a time of prayer.
Lord God, we come before you. We ask that you would come and be present with us in a special way. We know you're always with us. But we cry out, O come, O come, Emmanuel, asking that you would enter into our hearts and into our physical presence here as we worship with you and into the physical presence of those who are worshiping at home. We ask your blessings upon this time that our hearts may be truly open to you, that we may be able to express in our limited words, but fully through our spirit to your spirit, what our needs and wants and wishes, and hear from you what your call and your commandments and your love and your truth might be heard and accepted by us. Lord God, as we come before and worship you this first Sunday of Advent, we are looking forward to your coming. We look forward to your coming in special ways like at a worship service. We look forward to your coming into parts of our lives that maybe we have cut off from you. Maybe we have kept that door of our, our lives locked from your presence. We look forward to your second coming as you return to the earth to make all things right in final victory. Lord, help us to be ready for your advent, your emergence, your coming to us. Forgive us, Lord, where we've fallen short, where we've sought to do our own thing, to make ourselves happy, to worry only about ourselves. Give us a sense of your heart, your eyes, your desires, to reach out to others and to touch them with your love, to care for them, to provide protection to them in the way that we live. Even if it's something simple like wearing a mask or something more difficult like stepping before a person to save their life. Lord God, help us to be always ready to be your disciples, your children, your followers. Lord, we need your spirit to do that. By ourselves, we are not strong enough. At best, we end up trying to be our own messiahs. Save us from that messiah complex Enable us to be your followers, your children, your disciples, who allow you to be Messiah, who allow you to be Lord and Savior. For that's when we truly fulfill our destinies and become the people you've created us to be. Lord God, work in us and through us that we might touch the lives of others, that we might bring them a little bit of your love and light and truth. Lord God, we ask that you would hear our individual prayers as we bring them in the silence of our voices. Hear us in this time of silent prayer. Lord God, hear these prayers. Answer them according to your will. The ones we have prayed and the ones that others have prayed. We pray in agreement that your will might be done. Help us to see your answers to prayer, especially when they don't look much like what we're expecting. Help us to recognize them and lift up a prayer of thanks as you have answered our prayers. This we ask in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's the children's message. If the children would come on up. How you guys doing? Uh, good. Yeah, I've been good like that before. You know what I'm holding here? An angel ornament. And if you look at that tree over there, what kind of ornaments does it have? A lot of angel ornaments, isn't it? You know... That's what we call stuck in a rut. No, that's not what's going on there. You know, it's, it's not lack of creativity because they're not all the same angel ornaments. There are mostly different ones. There's some that are the same. And when you get that many up there, it's hard not to have some that are the same. But those ornaments represent each family provides an ornament to hang on that tree. Each family of the church. And I don't know if we've gotten new ones recently, but this is a good time as any to remind folks, if you haven't donated an angel ornament, you can find one somewhere this Christmas season. That's your mission if you should decide to accept it. And uh, this ornament is not on the tree. Anybody know why it's not on the tree right now? Because I took it off the tree. Good guess, but that isn't the answer. So, Bree, I'm surprised because you were here when this angel got its wings clipped. Because the, the wings were broken on it, okay? Actually, it was just one, and I was in the process of gluing it when I dropped it. Something bumped into it and dot, 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 and broke the other wing. So, it was just, that's, you know what? There's going to be, when it comes to Christmas events and stuff, there's going to be times like that. But we had the glue. We had the technology. We put both wings back on this angel. And so you can see where it broke and it's now looking right. So it's a nice angel. It's the, the different angel ornaments. Some of them are white. Some are gold. Some are kind of glass, crystal-like. And uh, so wide variety. What's that? I feel that's wood. Wood, that's right. There's a wide variety. And so, um, there's the question. Do you know which angel is your family's? Ooh, that's something else you can do this Christmas. After church sometime, you can go and see if you can find your angel up there. So, we, we tried to make it so you could look at all of them. There's none on the very back side so that you could see them all. But uh, this, is, this is a tradition, right? This is one of the traditions the church does. And we have... Individual traditions are the way we celebrate Christmas. So one of the things that can happen is, uh, let's go to the next slide and the one after that. So this is something that my grandkids put together. Here is a nativity set. All right. What do you notice strange about that? Can you all see? What's a little odd about that nativity set? Peppa Pig, right? I like how you put the question mark at the end of that. There's, there's extra characters, right? It's kind of different, isn't it? So somebody's being creative, right? And they're, this, is, this is one image of what at least the kids thought of as they thought about the Christmas story and Jesus in the manger and that kind of stuff. And this is who they put in their, their little, um, how should I put it, diorama, okay? And so we all do that. So there's a, here's a nativity set here. And, you know, as you look at that, it, Jesus is laying in a manger here, and he's got a gold rope uh, around the manger, and Mary's wearing some nice jewelry. Um, Joseph's got some, some nice stuff. Now, is that the, what it would have looked like if we'd been back and taken a photo? 
Is that what it would have looked like if we'd taken a photo up there? No. These are artistic ways that we remember Christ's birth. And so there's a little license when it comes to art. You can think creatively. The, one of the things this person did is they wanted to keep it all white and gold. So that's the only colors in this nativity set. And uh, so because of that, they used gold as a highlighter to highlight different things to draw attention to what they were doing. So when you think about your Christmas traditions, you'll have some things you do at home. Some things we do at church, like the Advent candle. You might do that at home, but most people just do that at church and uh, have an Advent wreath and they light a candle for each Sunday. So this Sunday we have one candle lit. Next Sunday, how many are we going to have lit? Two. It'll be the second Sunday of Advent, right? And so these are traditions we use to keep time with the gospel, to remember the story about Jesus' birth. And so even though the story's a little different, the way people tell it, it's still about the same, it's, it should be about the same thing. And that is the coming of Jesus into the world, the coming of the Son of God in the flesh. And so we remember that. All right, I'd like you guys to help me as I say a prayer. You ready? Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for nativity sets. Thank you for Christmas trees. Thank you for all the traditions that point to you. Amen. All right, guys, thanks for coming on up. So, Oftentimes on Improv Sunday, um, we, you know, it's extemporaneous, um, so it's improvisational. But another thing is that um, it's, it's the kind of sermon, because I'm given the passage at that moment, I tend to walk through the passage um, as a part of the sermon. So it, it feels as much like a teaching as um, more so, I should say, than a normal sermon would. So I, I kind of apologize for that, but on the other hand, it's, it's an opportunity to uh, see something bigger. We may not make it through the entire chapter 12. As a matter of fact, that last verse really belongs with the next story anyway. So, but um, we'll, get, we'll get to a certain point where I feel like we've we kind of got the feel of it and covered it. So the first thing that we need to know is, as we look at the book of Revelation, chapter 12 really is focused on the birth of Jesus. Now, when, when I say that to people and they go, what? That doesn't sound right. Book of Revelation is about the future. It's about what's going to happen. Well, not completely. And uh, so one of the things we got to keep in mind in the book of Revelation, it is apocalyptic. That is the type of literature that's used. It's a, it's a way the story is told. And what that means is it uses big pictures, huge dramatic images, and, um, and it, it describes things not necessarily literally. They, they might be, they might not. That's one of the things about apocalyptic. It's hard to tell which part is supposed to be, quote, you know, the solid historical, that's the way it's going to look, and which part is more of a symbolic description. It uses so much symbolism, it's hard to know, except that it's pointing us towards something real. Something that's either happened in the past, is happening now, or will happen in the future. And a lot of times when we look at apocalyptic literature, like in the book of Daniel, as an example, some of the visions that Daniel has, it really is about the past, present, and the future. And the book of Revelation is the same way. It includes all of those ingredients, and it's really assembled in a number of stories, but they're broken down into one revelation following another revelation following another revelation. It's all one big revelation, but it's almost like these individual chapters that give you glimpses of what God has done, is doing, and will do. So as 21st century Americans... And many, many people throughout time and in place, we're most interested in what's happening next because, you know, we want to be ready. And that's good. 
There's nothing wrong with that. Except that the tendency is to see everything that we're reading and think that it's something that's going to happen instead of something that has happened. Chapter 12 is mostly about what has happened. So it tends to be focused primarily in the past. So I'm going to start off uh, with verse 1. A great portent appeared in heaven. So a portent is a vision, um, a big scene, a big picture. So, so John, who is uh, experiencing this revelation coming from Jesus Christ. So it's the revelation to John from Jesus Christ um, for the church as a whole. In this part of it, this also helps us divide up into, okay, we're now moving into something a little bit different than what we covered in chapter 11. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. So, does anybody recognize that description? Sun, moon, 12 stars? Does that come, sound familiar? A dream that Joseph had. It's from the Old Testament. And much of what is in the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible and the last book in the New Testament, is really tied to and really needs to be understood by looking at the Old Testament. So if you don't know much about the Old Testament or you're not real familiar with the stories there, the book of Revelation is even more mysterious. It's less mysterious the more you know about the Jewish faith, and especially about the Jewish scriptures, what we would call the Old Testament. So this is a description of Israel. So for Joseph's dream, the sun was his father, the moon his mother. So Israel, his father, right? And his, his mother and the 12 stars are the sons that were born to Israel. And each of those is one of Joseph's brothers, and he is one of the stars. And so in his dream, that's how he pictures his family. Or now, the way we look at it, looking back, as the beginnings of the nation of Israel. So this is Israel, this woman. And... In verse 2, it says, she was pregnant and was crying out with birth pangs in the agony of giving birth. So this pregnancy is, um, it can be for a specific individual, but the idea is that the nation is pregnant waiting for the revealing of a new person or a new uh, member of their tribe, their family, their nation, who will change things, something dramatic. And this, of course, we know is the Son of God coming in the flesh is Jesus. So this is the person Jesus is going to be born. Then verse 3, we got another shift here. Then another portent appeared in heaven. So some of you remember back in the old days when you were watching a Western on TV. It would say, you know, this is what's happening at the railroad tracks. Damsels being tied up, put on the railroad tracks, or somebody's being kidnapped, or the bank is being robbed in town. And then they'd go, and meanwhile, back at the ranch, and meanwhile, another portent appeared. This is what John is telling us. We're shifting gears. This is kind of at the same time. It's all part of the same story, but we need to take our focus and turn it from the woman to something else. A great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. Then the dragon stood before the woman who was about to bear a child so that he might devour her child as soon as it was born. So the heads and um, the horns are slightly different but similar. So a horn was a symbol for power. So this meant some great power. And a lot of times we think of a nation state or a city state as being 
a horn, it has this power. It has an army, a military, it has some power to it. The head is kind of, it can be a, a specific ruler or a specific version of that nation. So, for example, in Egypt, if you were studying Egyptian history, you would talk about different um, kingdoms, right? And during this kingdom, that's the pharaohs from 19 to 27 or whatever. And um, if you were looking at the nation of um, uh, the, the emperor, empire of Rome, you would say, well, this was during its republic period. Or this was during the time when um, the republic, it was republic in the name only and the Caesar or the emperor was totally in charge and whatever the emperor did, the, the emperor got away with. There was nobody to question it. And so you can look at periods and this would be sometimes it could be a head is a reference to a specific period of that nation or it could be the nation itself or it could be a specific leader. So it's, it's usually a, it's focused on the idea of authority. And most of the time authority and power go together, but not always, right? So in Jesus first coming, he had authority, but he didn't have a lot of power, at least not earthly or worldly power. He didn't have much of that, but he had a lot of authority. Now, he did have access to heavenly power through the Holy Spirit. He could do things that were powerful. So, but authority and power, usually we think about them as going together, but not always. Um, so, this gives kind of both of those categories. The dragon, the red dragon, we don't know who it is yet. We're going to get that information a little bit later. His tail swept down a third of the stars in heaven. Now, we're not sure what that means initially, but one of the things that stars are used for in the Old Testament and in the New, especially in the book of Revelation, is to refer to um, angels, specific angels. Sometimes uh, in, in the beginning of the book of Revelation, it talked about a specific church, a body of Christ in a specific city was a lampstand, right? It was a particular uh, lamp or lampstand. And so, um, again, the symbolism here suggests that these are angels that have been swept down out of heaven in some fashion. It says, then the dragon stood before the woman. So the dragon's primary goal here is to wipe out this child that's going to be born to Israel. So it's a child of Israel, it's a child in that nation, and this child is trouble for the dragon, and the dragon is seeking to destroy it as soon as it's born. So really, right away, before it comes of age, gets to the point where it's wielding power. And um, <clears throat> in verse 5, we continue with the story. And she, this is the nation of Israel again, and she gave birth to a son, a male child who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. So this is going to be a special child. And anybody who is, you know, familiar with the Old Testament immediately goes, this has got to be the Messiah, right? This is obvious. It's suggested before, but this pretty well nails it down. Going to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Now, Jesus didn't do that yet. That's going to be in the second coming. But in the first coming, he establishes himself as the one with authority to rule. In the second coming, he uses his power to rule. But her child was snatched away, snatched away from the dragon, and taken to God and to his throne. So he's getting supernatural protection here. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God so that there she can be nourished for 1,260 days. Why does that number sound important? <laughs> it's not a magical number, but numbers can be, again, symbolic, or they can also be literal. And again, when you're reading 
um, apocalyptic literature like the book of Revelation, you're never quite sure of the mix. But this one's actually kind of simple to figure out if we just want to translate it into something else. So one of the things, anybody, um, anybody ever noticed how Christmas is always December 25th, but Easter, we can never make up our mind? Right? It's bopping around here and there. It's, it's like in a, it, there's like a six week difference or five week difference between when Easter occurs the earliest possible and the latest possible. And the reason is pointing to why this number is important, but it doesn't mean anything, doesn't say anything to us, is that the Hebrews used a lunar calendar to keep time. We use a solar calendar. So we have 365 days in a year, and then every fourth year we have 366. And then every hundredth year, what is it? We're back to 365, so even, if it, even though it falls on a leap year, we only do, we don't use it. And then every some thousand years, we put it back in again, or something weird like that, right? So we got this bizarre formula for keeping time. So when we really are honest and look at ours, where it doesn't come out evenly, we shouldn't be too mm, proud or arrogant when we look at the, the Israelites who used the moon to keep time, not the sun. But they also used the movement of the sun and equinox and all that kind of stuff to keep track of years. And so they didn't have leap years with an extra day. They had leap years with an extra month. And that really, you know, that was every... A little bit less regular than ours, so to speak. It was on an irregular schedule, but they would kind of line things back up with that. So here's the way to think of it. Each of their months had 30 days. So they didn't have to learn any poems to figure out how many days in this month, right? And they had 12 months in the year normally. So 12 times 30 is 360. And then every so often they would add an extra month to kind of try to get things back on schedule living their their nation was closer to the equator so the seasons weren't quite as dramatically shifting like ours do because we're further from the equator so our seasons are more dramatic but if you take that number of where's it at here i'll find it 1260 days is three and a half years right did i get that right 42 months. So this, again, we're, we're, we're flowing through this story, and you want to be careful not to be too rigid with it, but you're trying to get the gist of it, the feel. And this Messiah that's born, somebody the, who is functioning because they're being egged on by this dragon is seeking to kill the child. So Herod is the specific... Um, goofball in chief uh, that's there in Israel. He's just a puppet uh, king, but he wields some power. And so he doesn't have power over Roman troops. So after the Messiah is born, when he finds out because of the Magi that the Messiah has been born, he sends troops, Jewish troops, Jewish guards from the temple out to kill the Jewish Messiah. And so when you see those paintings and they show Roman soldiers, no, the Romans didn't do that. That was something the Jews did. And um, so as he's sending those troops out, this is in the big picture. Remember, it's this dramatic imagery. Uh, and you got you to gotta be a little... Think as an artist thinks, is the way I, I like to help you understand it. The Messiah is being put out of the way. And so this Messiah is sent to Egypt so that Herod cannot find him. The Egypt is like a wilderness, okay? Because there's not that many believers there and where they're going, they're really in the middle of nowhere, they're not able to work, so Joseph can't get any regular work there. 
and he has to live off of whatever he carries out there. When we look at the story in Matthew, it explains where he gets his financing, all right? But that doesn't happen until later. And he is in Egypt for three and a half years. It's suggested by this story. Now, is that literally three and a half years? I don't know. But it's for a while. It's for several years before he returns back to Jerusalem. It might be longer than that, might be shorter than that, but it's a number of years. And what happens during those three and a half years is Herod dies. And so Jesus enters back in, goes up to Nazareth, back to the hometown, not to Bethlehem. And so that couples with the story as we remember it. So now we're going to see what's going on in the heavenly scene. So all of this is kind of a mix between heaven and earth. But in verse 7, we get focused on heaven alone. So the war that happens here is not, there's no duplicate on earth. There's, there's not a heavenly action going on behind some earthly event. This is just happening in heaven and nobody's paying attention. So it says, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back. But they were defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. So remember the third of the stars? So the dragon is, uh, has the third of angels, and Michael, who is an archangel, one of the main angels up in heaven, he's commanding two-thirds of the stars, or two-thirds of the angels in this battle. They're defeated, and the dragon and the angels are thrown down to earth. These angels that fight with the dragon, we call them demons. Uh, the, the angel that's thrown down in the Old Testament is always referred to as the Satan. And that is actually a title. It is the same name uh, that is given to a prosecuting attorney. Sorry if you're a prosecuting attorney, nothing... Nothing mean and nasty meant by it, but the word in Hebrew, Satan, literally means accuser. And in the Old Testament, the Satan, and it's always used with an article because it's a title, not the name of somebody, is the prosecuting attorney of heaven, who we find out is becomes Satan by name, personal name, but it in the Old Testament, it's it's, it's just his job title. So he's the prosecutor from heaven. And he, in the Old Testament, always functions as an obedient servant, angel of God, and does what God tells him to do. And so if you look in the book of Job or other places where Satan is mentioned, he only does what God tells him. He, he has no authority and no power, which becomes important in the New Testament, to do anything without God commanding him to do it. Which causes us to go back to Job and look at it a little differently. Right? So he is, what, what happens here is, because of the end of this battle, the result of this battle, Satan no longer has a place, the devil, the accuser, the Satan no longer has a place in heaven, is thrown down. And in the New Testament, Satan becomes a personal name and is only used that way in the New Testament. Well, in the Old Testament, it's never used that way. And the deceiver, the accuser, the key, the title, the, the, the thing that defines what Satan does is to accuse. That was his job when he was doing it right, and that becomes his, uh, the, his main work, uh, if you would, when he's doing it wrong as a liar and deceiver. So he's leading the rebellion and is thrown out and is now um, down on earth. And so one of the things that we see is associated with the coming of Jesus is that supernatural evil is now kind of let loose on earth in a way that it wasn't before. And one of the things, if you study in different religions and different history, you'll notice that de the idea of demon possession and those kind of things really comes becomes a thing that people believe in and, and notice and, and take account of at about the time that Jesus is born. 
So supernatural evil is now running loose on earth. Jesus comes and will be sent, and I'm running ahead with my story, to combat supernatural evil on earth with supernatural good now present as well. Uh, okay, let's see here. The great dragon was thrown down, the ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan and deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven proclaiming, now have come the salvation and the power of the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. So you notice here, it's, it's kind of interesting how it puts it. It separates power and authority. And what's coming is the Messiah holds both. So Jesus, the Messiah, has power, he has power and authority. For the accuser of our comrades has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. But they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. See how we're leaping through time now? We have the sacrifice of Jesus. So at this point, we have shifted into, remember, think like an artist. We've, we've shifted to after the resurrection of Jesus, after the crucifixion of Jesus. And the followers of the Lamb, the, the nation of Israel, who is following their Messiah, are what will soon be called, or by the time this book is written, are called Christians. Followers of the way, followers of the Messiah. But they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they did not cling to life even in the face of death. So everything's not cushy because the Messiah has come to earth. But now they have the power to conquer even though things aren't easy. In a way, things have gotten worse because the battle is now down here on earth and is being fought out with humanity being involved in it. For they did not cling to life even in the face of death. Rejoice then, you heavens and those who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you with great wrath because he knows that his time is short. And so John, as he's writing, he's, he's receiving this revelation and he's saying, it's going to get even worse. It's going to get harder. There's going to be persecution of Christians. The dragon fights again on earth. So when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman, that's Israel. And also you want to think in terms of as, as John understands it, the new Israel or the Israel that's following the Messiah is the true Israel not those who have rejected the Messiah. The woman who had given birth to the male child, but the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she could fly from the serpent into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time. So this phrase either refers to a time, one year, times, two years, and half a time, half a year. Either to three and a half years, if you want to think about it literally, or to this unspecified time that it just kind of keeps going and you're like, when's Jesus coming back? When's he going to set things right? And so it can be taken literal or it can be taken in a figurative way there. So, uh, let's see here. Then from his mouth, the serpent poured water like a river. This is that idea of power, persecution, danger. So you think of it as persecution pouring out. After the woman to sweep her away with the flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman. It opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from its mouth. So God has sent assistance through angels and through teachers, and through prophets, and uh, folks who give us the, deliver the gospel, the good news, and fight the, the works of the devil. The dragon was very angry with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children, those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And that's the end of that 
story of chapter 12. That final verse really belongs in the next one. Just a, a quick uh, note here. Chapters and verses were added hundreds of years later to make it easy to focus on. And what part are you talking about? Well, it's... So this wasn't part of the original writing, these numbers. They're just added later on. So I think one of the things it does for me, and it, it, it gives us a big picture of where the incarnation, the coming of Jesus, the first coming, however we might describe it, fits into the larger picture of God's rescue plan, of his desire to rescue humanity, and specifically his people who are following him. And so here we have, um, we see the action that there's supernatural evil at work uh, to combat the coming of Jesus. It's not just some easy, Jesus comes, everybody says, oh, it's the Son of God in the flesh, great, this is the Messiah we're all been waiting for, and let's just follow him. That things are more complicated than that in reality, and because of that, we have not just the earthly problems to deal with, we've got supernatural problems that get implanted in the earthly issues to confuse the good guys and to lead the bad guys to victory over us. So um, one of the dangers, obviously, is to, to draw too many conclusions about, well, which of us are good guys and which of us are bad guys on external earthly means. Remember, in Jesus' first coming, he does not use earthly power. He'll do that in his second coming. And until he comes back, we got to be careful. We got to rely on Jesus' authority, which is the authority of the word, not of earthly power. That's always the authority. That's the powers that are used by the dragon, the evil one. And so we have to seek and use the powers that Jesus gives us, which are the powers of his word, of truth, of righteousness, of good works, of um, compassion and charity. Uh, these are the powers that God has given us to use until Christ returns, and Christ will take care of everything at that point. We don't have to worry about stuff at that. So... It's a different way of thinking about the birth of Jesus. And uh, we don't tend to think of it because, again, our tendency is to think everything in Revelation is a chronological list of what's going to happen in the future. But each of the different visions is a different picture. Some point to the future, most of them, I would say. But many of them point to what was going on presently in the church. And some, like chapter 12, point as much to the past as anything else. So let's pray. Lord God, we give thanks for your word, and we ask that you would equip us to know your word more intimately, to use it in battle, and to fight the good fight as we seek to help people see the light, flee from the power of the dragon, and find truth and salvation in the Messiah, the child that was born of the woman Israel. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 217, if you didn't hear that. So grab your hymnals. We'll sing all the verses. I think there's just three there for us.
a prayer. This is from Simeon. Um, if you look in the scriptures, this is toward the end of Luke chapter 2. This is after Jesus has been circumcised. They've gone to Jerusalem so that they can make the proper offering before returning to Nazareth. And um, they meet Simeon in the temple. And this is Simeon's uh, essentially prayer of thanks to God because he's seen the Messiah. And he has gotten a special word through the Holy Spirit that this baby before you here in this temple uh, who, who has parents which are clearly poverty stricken, not able to offer the proper sacrifice, but are offering the, um, the kind of the, the seconds, um, the, the sacrifice that is allowed for those who are very poor. And as they offer the sacrifice, Simeon bumps into them. So either right before or right after this, and he's giving uh, thanks to God because God said, this is the one. This is the one you've been waiting and praying for. So let's say this um, as our prayer to God because we have seen and recognized Jesus. Let us pray. Lord, now let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the presence of all people, a light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Amen. So our closing praise is number 196. And let's sing both verses. Go now in peace, knowing that Christ goes with us. And when we face the power of the evil one, the red dragon, the great Satan, the devil, we know that we have one who is greater, one who has defeated him already, and will finally defeat him when he returns the second time. Amen.